Good day, everyone. Welcome to Ready, Set, Go, a webinar series sponsored by HUD's Office of Special Needs Assistance Programs, known as SNAPS. I'm Tony Gallo, and I am the moderator of today's webinar. On behalf of the SNAPS office, I would like to thank all of you for joining us. Today's webinar is Homeless Status Record Keeping Requirements. We'll be featuring the following presenters. Anne Oliva, who is, as all of you know, the Director of HUD's Office of Special Needs Assistance Programs, or SNAPS. Tom, Tom Albanese, an associate with APT Associates. And Teresa Silla, who is a senior analyst at APT Associates. Additionally, we have a virtual help desk representative on the line with us to answer your content questions. Next slide, please. I have some logistical announcements to make before we get into the content of the webinar. Today's webinar will last approximately one hour, and it is being recorded. The webinar recording will be posted on the HUD HRE website at www.hudhre.info. As an attendee of this webinar, your microphone will be automatically muted, and that is so that the line is clear for all people that are trying to listen. Speakers and the moderator, myself, will announce next slide as we progress from slide to slide. We have received some feedback from participants that this announcement can be distracting. We would like to be responsive to the feedback and eliminate this announcement. However, there is often a time lag between the presentation and what the audience members see on their screen. If we do not indicate that our comments relate to the next slide, it can be very disconcerting for audience members whose screens continue to display the old slide. So thank you in advance for your patience and understanding. Next slide, please. We recommend using your phone rather than your computer computer speakers to hear the audio for today's presentation, as you will be able to hear more clearly. There are approximately a 1,000 attendees on this webinar today, so there may be a slight delay in the advancement of slides. In other words, when we are talking about a particular slide, you might not see it for a second or two before your slides automatically advance. If you experience any other technical difficulties, please request assistance by using the questions box in your GoToWebinar toolbar. Next slide, please. By using that same questions feature in the GoToWebinar tool, toolbar that I just referenced, you may submit content-related questions as well. Our Help Desk Representative Marcy Thompson of HUD will do her best to respond to you directly. All of your questions are important to us, and we will try to address them. If you have questions that cannot be addressed today, please submit them to the virtual Help Desk. When you insert your question, please reference this presentation, Homeless Status Record Keeping Requirements, in your question to provide the help desk with additional context. A brief feedback survey of this webinar will be emailed directly to, to the email through which you registered for today's webinar. Participants are strongly encouraged to respond to the evaluation, which helps us inform the delivery of future webinars. Poll questions will be asked throughout the webinar as well to test the knowledge of participants. We really encourage you to participate as they help give us a sense of how the webinar is going. As a reminder, you will remain muted throughout the call, but can submit questions that you have via the GoToWebinar toolbar, again, which is on the right side of your screen. Next slide, please. Remember that this webinar is a follow-up follow webinar 
to determining homeless and at-risk status, income, and disability. We're assuming that you have already listened to those webinars and that you are familiar with the definitions of homeless and persons with disabilities. We will not be reviewing the definitions during this particular webinar. We will be focused solely on the record-keeping requirements related to these definitions. If you need a tool to reference the definitions, the listserv announcements for this webinar recommended a resource from the HUD HRE called Criteria and Record-Keeping Requirements for the Definition of Homeless. Again, the recommended resource should you need to reference the definitions is called Criteria and Record-Keeping Requirements for the Definition of Homeless. It is available on the HUD HRE. Note that this webinar will be followed by another webinar. The webinar on record-keeping requirements specific to those at risk of homelessness or at risk status and income has been scheduled for May 15, 2012, which is a week from today. Next slide, please. Upon completion of today's webinar, you should be able to understand requirements to develop local policies and procedures for record keeping, incorporate and use HUD's hierarchy for documentation in these local policies and procedures, adopt and use documentation standards to ensure compliant records, and identify acceptable documentation for each homeless definition category. Now, I'm happy to hand over the presentation to Anne Oliva. Next slide, please. Thank you, Tony. And good afternoon to everybody uh, who's on the phone with us today and on uh, the, the GoTo meeting with us today. I want to welcome you again to today's webinar. Uh, I did want to mention one thing before I get started. Due to the high volume of people who are interested in this webinar, we will be doing it again on Friday. So uh, a listserv message did go out about that, so there's, there's information. There we go. Sorry. Okay. So I want to start out by uh, quickly giving you an overview about why we decided to go into this detail about record keeping. Record keeping was included in the homeless definition rule because homeless eligibility, and many of you have heard me say this before, homeless eligibility is the most frequent finding during HUD's monitoring of uh, homeless programs. And it often results in grantees having to repay uh, funds or funds being returned to HUD. So the point of these rules is to clarify both for HUD and for our grantees what should be in your files. And, you know, this homeless definition is new and it's more complex than the definition that we have been using for McKinney-Vento programs funded by HUD in the past. And therefore, just like under the Homelessness Prevention and Rapid Rehousing Program, there's a need, as, as we add complexity, there is a need for us to provide you with additional detail. So, you know, again, that somebody meets this definition is really the core of our programs here that are, that are managed out of the SNAPS office. And these programs really can only serve people who are defined as homeless. So it's important for you all to understand somebody's status as they're coming into the program. Because we have more people who experience homelessness at any given point in time during the year than we actually have beds. So we want to first ensure that all of our programs are being used for the purpose that was intended by Congress, which is to serve people who are homeless. Um, and we want to make sure our resources are used in the most efficient and effective way possible so that we're getting at our overall goal of preventing and ending homelessness. So if you're not really documenting and understanding the situation of the people who are presenting for services and housing, how can you really know what that situation is. And then the last thing I want to note uh, while we're still on this, this prep slide is that really, for the most part, you should already be doing some form of this documentation. Uh, but HUD has never really written down the specific kinds of details uh, that we were expecting to see in your files. So I hope that 
although it seems like there's a lot of words and detail in the rule itself, this will really help to clarify for all of you as well as for our field offices that, um, and, and that that will result in fewer monitoring findings. So I'd like to go to the next slide, please. So I also want to reiterate a couple of other things before I turn it over to our, to our presenters. In some cases, there are only specific options for a kind of documentation that is going to be acceptable to HUD. But in some cases, there is no hard and fast rule. And you will have to use your professional judgment uh, to determine what the best course of action is. We urge you to document your effort to get that you know, to, to get the documentation, understand how people are presenting in the, in the case file so that when we come to monitor, we can understand what you tried to do. But I also want to be crystal clear on this next point. Never do we expect you to put somebody's safety in jeopardy solely to get third-party documentation. I think uh, Tom is going to talk about this in some detail a little bit later, but I just wanted to say that up front. Never would we expect you to put somebody's safety in jeopardy in order to get third-party documentation. Next slide, please. Briefly, I want to remind you all about how these new rules apply to the current program. This is something that we've talked about uh, several times now. Uh, so again, the, these new rules apply to projects funded under the Emergency Solutions Grants Program. And what that means to you all in the field is that is the second allocation of funds from fiscal year 2011, and then all everything that was allocated after that. It also means that it applies to new and renewal projects funded in the fiscal year 2011 continuum of care competition. That is the supportive housing program and the shelter plus care program. And then again, all future continuum of care program new and renewal projects. Next slide, please. So very quickly, I want to do an overview of what we're going to be talking about today and um, what the record keeping requirements actually are in the homeless definition final rule. So the rule establishes that you must develop and use local policies and procedures for record keeping. Many times we see inconsistent application or a lack of rules around who gets into programs and how things are documented at a particular agency. And that tends to be the kind of thing that gets people into trouble. Uh, again, we're going to specify the preferred order of documentation. We're going to specify which documents are sufficient to demonstrate compliance. And the rule also provides examples of acceptable documentation by category. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to the folks who are going to do the bulk of our presentation today. Uh, Teresa, you're up next. Thank you, Anne. This section is on policies and procedures. And as Anne already mentioned, program policies and procedures have two main purposes. The first is to help staff comply with the record keeping requirements. And the second is to ensure that all intake staff in a program are determining and documenting homeless status fairly and consistently between potential program participants. So this is why recipients must formally adopt written policies and procedures for their ESG, their shelter plus care, their SHP, and COC funded programs. Next slide, please. Policies and procedures must require staff to document the evidence that is gathered as part of the intake process. It's very likely that programs do this already, gather notes and records in case files for clients. However, it's important to recognize that the documentation requirements here apply to all persons seeking assistance, not just those deemed eligible for assistance. So if a person is determined ineligible, the documentation in their case file must reflect reasons related to eligibility. Finally, policies and procedures must be consistent with the record keeping requirements. This includes HUD's hierarchy for documentation, which I'm going to talk about next. But also, this means that everything that we discuss in this presentation 
must be incorporated in the policies and procedures that are developed by recipients. Next slide, please. So HUD has a preference for specific types of documentation. It's clearly specified in the homeless final rules, so we're going to discuss that order here. We're also going to discuss exceptions. As Anne already mentioned, there is no expectation that someone will be jeopardized. You know, their um, emergency needs must be met. And so we'll discuss those exceptions. We'll also suggest some tips for incorporating HUD's preferred order in your local policies and procedures. Next slide, please. So what is HUD's preferred order for documentation? First and foremost, intake staff should focus on obtaining third-party documentation. This includes both written and oral documents. So what do we mean by written? A written documentation may be already available, like HMIS records. We'll provide more examples later as well. Oral records would actually be statements that are recorded by intake staff. So they're statements that are provided from the third party, but recorded by the intake staff. Now, notice that there's a preference here. Written third-party documentation is listed before oral because written documentation is preferred to oral documentation. Um, if third-party documentation is not available or appropriate, intake staff observations are preferred over self-certification. And self-certification, this is an affidavit or a statement provided by the individual or head of household seeking assistance. Now, clients will present with unique circumstances and needs, and it'll limit intake staff ability to obtain the preferred document, their preferred document being third party written. So intake staff are going to have to use their professional judgment based on the details of the case and their prior experience with similar circumstances. When you're making your professional judgment, it's important and we recommend that due diligence, the efforts made to obtain preferred documentation should be described and recorded in the case file. Okay, So this preferred order, third party over intake staff and self-certification, is more or less the order for documenting conditions and criteria under all four categories of the homeless definition. However, as Anne already mentioned, there are some important exceptions. Next slide. In terms of exceptions, when an individual is applying for assistance to address their emergency needs, the lack of third-party documentation should not prevent that individual or family from immediately being admitted to emergency shelter or receiving street outreach services. The same goes for shelter services by a victim service provider. So when an individual or family is trying to access shelter services from a victim service provider, the lack of third-party documentation should not prevent them from accessing the assistance that they need. The other consideration here is safety. The regulations make specific provisions related to documenting housing status of individuals and families that are fleeing domestic violence, sexual assault, or stalking. So third-party documentation in those under those circumstances are only required if the agency providing services is not a victim service provider. Additionally, providers should not attempt to obtain third-party documentation or verification if the safety of the family or the individual is jeopardized in any way, shape, or form. Okay, next slide. Here we're suggesting some tips and recommendations we, we think it's important to create job aids for intake staff, adopt a checklist that reflects the preferred order, incorporate guidance and examples on exceptions so that staff know when they are allowed to deviate from the preferred order, create a section for due diligence so that intake staff get into the habit of documenting why third party written documentation is not available or appropriate, have a place in the checklist for already available records like HMIS or discharge paperwork that staff can refer to. Okay, next slide. 
everybody. This is Anne again. I'm going to be doing the poll questions today, and I'm going to do my best to make sure that I'm talking louder for those of you who thought that I was fading in and out earlier. So our first poll question is this one that's up on your screen. Emergency shelter, true or false, emergency shelters must obtain third-party documentation of homelessness before accommodating persons seeking shelter. True or false, folks? So we're waiting for everybody to uh, hit the buttons on your screen. And we're about uh, at 7, 80% voted. So I think we can wrap this one up and take a look and see what people said. OK, so 97% of you said false, which is great, because that is the correct answer. HUD recognizes that there are circumstances, of course, where it cannot be, or a third-party documentation cannot be obtained. So the record-keeping requirements themselves specifically state that the lack of third-party documentation shouldn't prevent a person from being admitted to emergency shelter or receiving street outreach services. And further than that, it just would be, it would be almost impossible for a shelter that operates on a 7 to 7 type of schedule um, to be able to get third-party documentation from everybody every night. So this is one of those exceptions that we put into the rule. Um, so I'm glad to see that 97% of you actually got it right. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Teresa, I think. Actually, oh, actually, I'm sorry. I'm turning it to Tom. Sorry about that. No problem, Ann. Thank you. Uh, so uh, this next section, we're going to talk uh, just briefly about standards for documentation. And uh, the intent here uh, is basically uh, to, to recognize that it's very challenging to uh, collect documentation in a consistent manner that uh, both meets uh, HUD requirements and assures that the uh, documentation is um, uh, has the appropriate uh, information for purposes of understanding and documenting uh, living situations. And so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, standards that uh, should be adopted and some uh, recommendations uh, along those lines. Next slide, please. So the first recommendation is that uh, recipients of uh, uh, the various um, uh, HUD programs uh, actually seek to adopt uh, standards in your policies and procedures that, that relate to uh, the specific types of documentation that uh, Teresa outlined uh, earlier and that we'll go into more depth on uh, later. Um, specifically, uh, there are, it, we, it's important to include in standards um, guidance around uh, uh, making sure the documentation clearly identifies who's providing uh, the verification or the documentation, who's the entity or the party uh, who's providing that, uh, how is um, the documentation uh, relevant to the situation. So standards should address uh, the need to specify the living situation in detail uh, sufficient that uh, somebody uh, reviewing the case file would readily understand uh, the situation. Uh, as well as being very uh, standard should, should uh, identify uh, and spell out the importance of being um, uh, specific in, uh, regarding the condition that's being documented. So for example, if uh, a person is uh, presently uh, staying in emergency shelter, the standard should dictate that documentation, uh, indicate that clearly on uh, the referral letter or other documentation provided. Um, so as a general guideline, uh, as Anne sort of alluded to earlier, uh, a good rule of thumb to keep in mind or a good uh, perspective to keep in mind that uh, is helpful in creating standards is to uh, consider them from the perspective of if uh, someone were to come and uh, look at a case file, whether it be HUD or another funder or just a supervisory uh, review uh, process, uh, would that individual, knowing nothing about uh, the, uh, the person who was screened, 
would they be able to readily understand what their living situation was and that they actually met uh, the conditions uh, for the given homeless category in that documentation uh, sufficiently uh, and clearly indicated that. So keep that in mind as you develop standards and that will assure that they're thorough and, and well thought through. Um, additionally, uh, it's important to specify standards relevant to each document, each type of documentation. As Teresa laid out, there are three general categories of documentation, third-party documentation, intake staff, uh, recorded observations, and then self-certifications from applicants themselves. So standards uh, for each of those are important to have. Next slide, please. So now we'd like to talk uh, a little bit about some um, standards that uh, are recommended and that actually uh, would be expected to be incorporated in policies and procedures and um, uh, as well as uh, reflected on the documentation uh, itself uh, if uh, it were to be uh, monitored by HUD. And we're going to start by looking at third-party written documentation, uh, which might be written letters or uh, referrals. Uh, from third-party providers or third-party entities, uh, let's say uh, a landlord, uh, for example, who uh, is um, uh, evicting a tenant or court documentation uh, um, that um, uh, has been provided. Basically, third-party documentation uh, generally needs to be on official um, uh, letterhead or some other stationary or some uh, paper that indicates the source. Um, there may be times, of course, uh, particularly in a doubled up situation, a love eviction, uh, if it's a host family or friend, of course, that would not be the expectation. But generally, it's, it's from the third parties um, on their letterhead. Should be signed and dated by the appropriate representative. And then there are additional um, criteria uh, or specifics to the condition uh, that would need to be uh, included. Uh, so, for example, if a person is coming uh, uh, from an emergency shelter, you would expect that uh, the, uh, the time frame and, uh, that the person is in the shelter, that their present uh, resident of the shelter would be clearly indicated. And we'll address that later as we get into specific um, uh, living situations and the documentation standards pertinent to each. Next slide, please. The next type of documentation going down the order of preference is third-party oral documentation. Uh, generally, as Teresa uh, mentioned, these are recorded by intake staff. It's by way of a statement made by a third party to intake staff. That intake staff then record uh, for the case file. Uh, that type of uh, documentation uh, is allowed in some uh, instances and uh, must be clearly um, uh, documented. Uh, so again, the record is, is uh, clear and uh, unambiguous about uh, um, what was recorded and who recorded this statement. So intake staff uh, should uh, be uh, clear in their documentation of oral statements who is making the statement uh, and what they are saying. Uh, ultimately, uh, the uh, recorded statement needs to be an accurate reflection of the conversation. And the intake staff, in order to record an oral statement, uh, will be asked to uh, or should additionally uh, certify that that statement is true and complete as provided to them uh, by uh, attesting to that and signing uh, the oral statement. Uh, basically on behalf of the third party as the intake staff uh, member who recorded the statement. Uh, it may be that oral statements are uh, recorded as a case file note, in which case, again, the intake staff person would have to sign and date that, uh, that, um, that note as being true and correct, uh, or complete, rather. And then, uh, however, uh, it's recommended here, and we'll note this a number of times uh, throughout the presentation, uh, that a standardized form be developed uh, to record such statements. It simplifies the process. It ensures that all the uh, 
uh, pertinent information is recorded. It provides a signature and date line, and it just makes sure the documentation uh, meets the given standard. Uh, next slide, please. The next type of, op of um, documentation, again, going down the preferred order, are recorded intake staff observations. These are um, what intake staff themselves are uh, observing um, if, uh, if they're uh, literally seeing um, a person uh, uh, staying outdoors in an encampment uh, or if they're otherwise assessing uh, an applicant and determining by virtue of the assessment uh, the given situation, and that uh, is what amounts to an intake staff uh, observation, their observation and assessment. Those observations and assessments as well need to be recorded in a case file. They need to be signed and dated as true and complete, again, certified uh, that they're uh, true and complete as observed and assessed. Um, and here again, it's recommended that uh, their, uh, that program seeks to create a standardized form uh, for those uh, intake worker uh, observations as well. Again, it simplifies the process and makes sure all pertinent information is collected. Next slide, please. The last form of documentation going down the preferred order list, of course, is self-certification. And these are statements provided by uh, the individual applicant or the head of household in the case of a multi-person household uh, attesting to uh, their situation or condition. Uh, they um, are uh, most often uh, in uh, written form, though there's some allowance for oral self-certification, very uh, narrow allowance we'll talk about later in the presentation. Generally, they're written statements that are certified, in other words, signed and dated by the applicant uh, attesting to uh, the fact that what they've stated is uh, both true and a complete reflection of their condition uh, or situation. In all cases, they must be recorded in the case file. Um, and again, in most cases, they need to be signed and dated uh, by the applicant, although there's one exception we'll talk about later in the presentation. Uh, the usually uh, a point to emphasize here is that self-certification is, is most often a form of documentation that should be used as a last resort. Uh, there are, of course, some exceptions. Persons fleeing violence, uh, persons in need of uh, emergency shelter uh, right away, uh, and so forth. As, as uh, the exceptions noted uh, earlier, self-certification in some instances is, in fact, the preferred and, in some cases, the only form of documentation. That's specific to the situation, uh, which we'll talk about. But generally, self-certification is the last form of documentation that programs should be obtaining after efforts are made to obtain third-party documentation. Um, in all cases, um, uh, and here again, we would recommend that uh, a standardized form be created for uh, self-certification statements uh, by applicants. So again, the right information is collected. Next slide, please. And then lastly, we want to just talk briefly about due diligence. As was noted, um, there's uh, certainly reasonable um, instances uh, uh, based on um, a circumstance where it's either not practical um, or not possible, or in some cases uh, would potentially uh, cause harm to uh, an applicant uh, to try to obtain third-party documentation. There's some instances where it's simply not appropriate. In those cases, um, and for particular housing situations, there is a requirement to document due diligence. Not in all cases. It's recommended uh, that due diligence efforts be documented uh, whenever third-party documentation is, is not obtained, but there are some uh, instances where it's not required and, and it's also not practical. In any case, due diligence essentially is a brief description of uh, efforts to obtain third-party. What, what were the circumstances? Um, uh, what caused uh, a lower uh, level of uh, documentation to be obtained versus third-party? And so forth. This may include 
uh, as part of the case record, phone logs indicating uh, attempts or email correspondence or even in some uh, cases copies of certified letters, depending again on, on the effort and, and the appropriateness of making the effort. Ultimately, uh, however, due diligence documentation is just that. It's, it's documenting in the case record efforts made to obtain documentation. And it should be clear enough that if, again, a third party were to look at the file, they would clearly understand the decision making and the rationale and why something other than third party documentation uh, was obtained. Lastly, here again, we would recommend a standardized form for uh, documenting due diligence efforts and, and making sure that those efforts are uh, also uh, not just described but signed by intake uh, worker staff as um, uh, true and complete uh, in terms of a, a record of their efforts. And next slide please and I'm going to pass it over to Teresa. Thank you Tom. Now that we've discussed third-party verification, intake staff observation, self-certification and due diligence in great detail, Let's talk about the specific documents that can be used to verify that an individual or family seeking assistance meets the conditions and criteria under the homeless definition. Next slide, please. So what we're going to do in this section is cover all four categories of the homeless definition, but we won't be talking about the definition in depth. So this is a good time to refer to the resource titled Criteria and Record Keeping Requirements for the Definition of Homeless. We sent out instructions for how to access the resource in the listserv message in advance of this webinar. And also, at the beginning of this webinar, in the chat box, there are instructions on how to access the resource. So if you have this access, if you have this resource available to you, now's a good time to be referring to it. Next slide, please. Under the first category, literally homeless, there are three living circumstances that are captured. The first is unsheltered homeless. If someone who is unsheltered presents, when documenting their homeless status, HUD's preferred order, third party first, intake observation second, and self-certification third, applies. However, there's an exception. We've talked about this several times already. If the unsheltered homeless individual or family is presenting to emergency shelter or has been identified for street outreach services, third-party documentation is not a requirement. Intake observations and self-certifications are sufficient. While we recommend due diligence and documentation of due diligence, there is no requirement for due diligence. Okay? So, Otherwise, when we are not talking about emergency shelter and we are not talking about street outreach services, the ability to obtain third-party documentation depends on the circumstances. So, for example, if an unsheltered individual is referred to a transitional housing program by a street outreach service provider, HMIS records may be readily available and reflect the provision of street outreach services. Alternatively, the referral may come from the local law enforcement agency or the emergency medical services, and it may be in the form of a letter or a standardized homeless certification. We haven't talked about HMIS records and homeless certifications before, so let's talk in further detail about these two records. Next slide, please. To use an HMIS service record as documentation of homeless status, HUD requires that the system meet two specific sets of standards. The first set of standards relates to the system, the HMIS implementation itself. Okay. Now, the system must retain an, audible, an auditable history of all entries. An auditable history of entries includes the person who entered the data, the date of entry, and any changes made to that entry. The second standard for the system is that the system should not allow for manual changes to the history related to a record. So this is not that 
a record related to an individual cannot be updated or changed. For example, data quality review might uncover an error in data entry. So maybe the intake staff forgot to enter age or sex, universal data elements. Intake staff can indeed go back and update the record, but the history of the record itself cannot be modified. So the history of the record should show that information related to age and sex were entered at a later date. And it should also show who entered that information. Okay? So those two standards relate to standards for the system itself. Now, in terms of there's another standard, and this is the standard for verifying homeless status. The dates of stay and services should be concurrent with the application for assistance. What do we mean? To use a specific record, the dates must make sense. A record of service from three years ago cannot be used to verify homeless status today. So the dates must make sense in terms of when um, stay or services were provided. Okay, next slide please. As the name suggests, a certification from homelessness is an affidavit that confirms an individual or family meets the homeless definition and the agency that has, has actually documented all of the criteria under the appropriate category of the homeless status definition. So what do we mean? If, for example, the previous example that I, that I provided, I said the referral from a local law enforcement agency or emergency medical services to a transitional housing program. So those particular agencies would be noting on the homeless certification that they confirmed this person was literally homeless and sleeping in a location that is not habitable. Don't forget that the general standards for written letters and referrals apply. So this must be an official communication on letterhead or program template to the extent possible. And it must be signed and dated by an appropriate representative of that third party. As with a lot of the other documents that we've suggested, Standardizing with fill-in-the-blank sections makes it easy to complete and makes it easy to stay consistent and adhere to the standards. And so we recommend a standardized form for certifications of homelessness. Next slide, please. Okay. This is the second living circumstances under category one, literally homeless, to document individuals or families that are in shelter Again, HUD's preferred order, third party first, intake observation second, and self-certification self third applies. Here, while there is no requirement to document due diligence for this category, to the extent that it is feasible, case file notes describing the efforts that, case man, that, that intake staff have made are a recommended practice. Otherwise, the ability to document you know, from a third party depends on the circumstances. So let me give you some examples. If an individual in an emergency shelter is referred to a supportive permanent housing program, HMIS records may be readily available and reflect the provision of emergency shelter. Remember that the standards that I talked about for HMIS shelter stays would be applicable. If that emergency shelter is not participating in HMIS, then the referral is likely to be in the form of a letter or a homeless certification from the emergency shelter provider. And we've already discussed that. So let's move on to the next slide. This is the third and last uh, circumstance under uh, category one, literally homeless. It's applicable to individuals that are exiting an institution. There are two conditions that are, you know, that are specific to this particular living circumstance. The first condition is that the individual must have been unsheltered or in emergency shelter prior to entry. Now, we've discussed how to document 
if an individual is unsheltered or in emergency shelter. So we can we've we've discussed this slide a fair a fair bit already, and so we can skip on to the next slide, please. The second condition for individuals who are exiting an institution is that the length of stay should be 90 days or less. The appropriate documentation in the preferred order is third-party written, third-party oral, and if neither written or oral third-party documentation is available, self-certification can be used, but due diligence is a requirement, must be recorded and included in the case file. Notice here that intake observation is not on the list. And this is because it's not, it's not going to be an appropriate form of documentation. The intake staff has not been interacting with the individual over the last 90 days. And so the intake staff cannot observe that the length of stay for this individual was 90 days or less. Okay? Finally, there is a standard for the documentation, and that standard is that the documentation must show that the length of stay was less than 90 days. It, it can do this by either specifying the entry and exit dates so that intake staff can actually calculate the number of days and ensure that it's less than 90 days, or the documentation itself should state the number of days. Next slide, please. I'm going to turn the presentation over to Anne for this poll question. Thank you, Teresa. Um, good afternoon again, everybody. So I'm going to deliver the next poll question, which is up on your screen. It's a true or false. An HMIS record of shelter, of shelter stay has the same weight as written, signed, and dated verification on shelter letterhead. So basically, is an HMIS record equal to a written, signed, and dated uh, shelter letter? I'll give everybody some time. Excellent. So as you can see up on your screen, 84% of you, I, I think it says 84, 84% um, of you got the right answer because the answer is true. HMIS records are a form of already available documentation and have the same weight as a written verification of stay. So good job, everybody. Um, before I turn it over to Tom, I did want to note that we are getting quite a few questions through the help desk about standardized forms and whether HUD intends to provide standardized forms for this type of documentation. Um, the answer is HUD doesn't intend to provide uh, the exact form that every community must use, but we'll provide technical assistance tools to you, including templates and that sort of um, guidance so that you can develop standardized forms at the local level because everybody's intake process is slightly different um, and we don't want to impose that specific requirement on communities. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Tom. Great. Thanks, Anne. Uh, next, we're going to talk about Category 2, which are uh, persons who are at imminent risk of homelessness. Uh, these are uh, persons who basically meet uh, three criteria per the Homeless Definition Final Rule, that is housing loss within 14 days, no subsequent uh, residents identified, and lack of resources and support networks to obtain other housing. Uh, each of these three conditions must be documented, and we'll talk about uh, those uh, criteria, uh, documentation standards uh, for each here. But I did want to note that the uh, documentation requirement varies both by the condition and by the type of housing that person may be in when they present uh, uh, with uh, this uh, type of imminent uh, risk um, situation. Next slide, please. So the first uh, condition, and, and let's talk first about uh, tenants uh, and homeowners. Uh, would be um, uh, documentation uh, from third parties. Now, I want to note, note here that uh, the regulations are uh, specific uh, in this regard in terms of uh, acceptable types of documentation. You'll note that we don't uh, also list um, 
uh, intake uh, worker observation or uh, self-certification here. The expectation, and uh, the, as the um, homeless as the definition final rule states, is that uh, this would uh, documentation uh, would be a court order uh, to leave, clearly uh, indicating uh, that uh, the uh, court order uh, is in effect within uh, 14 days uh, or less to leave uh, the residence. Uh, or an equivalent notice under state law, as the reg uh, states. Um, basically, uh, this is uh, uh, demonstrating then that the eviction is both in accord with state landlord-tenant laws and that legal due process uh, that such laws uh, afford has been followed and that the housing will, in fact, be lost uh, and the tenant will physically uh, need to move uh, within 14 days. Next slide, please. Uh, if uh, housing, however, uh, is presently in a uh, hotel or motel that the, um, that the individual or uh, family is paying for themselves, um, which is uh, distinct from a hotel motel stay uh, that might be paid for by a charity or nonprofit, those are considered uh, shelter uh, uh, placements. But if they're paying for the hotel motel themselves, then a self-certification uh, supported by other documentation when practical uh, is, uh, is what's expected. Um, intake staff should uh, seek to um, uh, you know, uh, assess the situation, obviously, obtain a self-certification. And again, only if, there's, uh, uh, if it's practical, appropriate, uh, to obtain uh, other documentation that supports that claim of uh, inability to stay there uh, longer than uh, 14 days, uh, then, then that should be obtained. Um, however, if, if that documentation is not available, or if it's not reasonable or appropriate, again, using professional judgment, then self-certification alone uh, is sufficient. In other housing situations, in other words, in uh, doubled up situations, which is most often the case, uh, self-certification uh, is uh, required. Um, however, self-certification also has to be supported by third-party verification. That is, third-party written verification that, yes, the host, family, or friend uh, is asking uh, their uh, family or friend to leave, uh, or that um, uh, the third party is, in fact, uh, uh, terminating uh, their, uh, their stay there um, in those doubled up uh, situations. Uh, that could be uh, provided orally if, if written uh, verification is not available. In other words, intake worker conversation with the host family or friend to verify that and then of course documented in the case file and signed, in other words, certified by the intake worker as being a true and complete reflection of the conversation. Um, only, however, in instances where it's simply not practical or appropriate to obtain that third party written or oral verification is self-certification alone acceptable. And in that case, then due diligence has to be documented per the standards we discussed earlier in the presentation. A description of efforts made, signed and dated by the intake staff. Next slide, please. The other two conditions. Um, also need to be documented. Uh, in these uh, cases, documenting no subsequent residents, documenting no other uh, resources and support networks, uh, it's acceptable to use self-certification uh, for both of those conditions. However, I want to stress that self-certification um, um, is typically um, uh, follows uh, an assessment, a conversation, a discussion about what other housing options one has, what other resources or support networks uh, one has uh, available. And, um, and that then serves as the basis for uh, having the uh, applicant household uh, then certify in writing uh, that that, in fact, is a true and complete reflection of their their condition. They have no housing. They have no resources. They have no other support system to draw upon to obtain housing. Uh, so there needs to be something generally, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, it's highly recommended that there be uh, 
uh, you know, a statement that actually um, uh, elaborates on whether it's the, the assessment record, case note files, or whatnot, and then, of course, the certification from the applicant household with a signature and date. Um, Lastly, uh, again here, uh, we're recommending that there be standardized forms, and as Ann pointed out, there will be uh, templates provided in the future, but those have to be, you know, um, uh, adapted to uh, local programs. So at this point, I'm going to pass it um, over. I think we have a point of um, clarification. Uh, Tony, um, before you hand the presentation over, I just wanted to mention to the participants that we are running a little bit behind schedule. Um, we anticipate that the webinar will run approximately five to ten minutes over the uh, scheduled time. So for those of you that could stay on, we please we encourage you to do so. Thank you. And so now we can pass this on to Teresa. Thank you, Tony. So Tom just covered Category 2, and I'm going to cover Category 3. There are four conditions in this category, and the first one is the one on the slide. Um, the individual or family must meet the homeless definition under an applicable federal statute. Now, um, to be defined as homeless under another federal statute, an agency administering the applicable federal program must provide third-party written verification of the individual or family's homeless status. Intake staff are not required or expected to determine whether individuals meet the homeless definition under another federal statute. Again, it's the agency administering the applicable federal program that's going to provide uh, documentation, that's going to determine and document um, that particular household. Note here, too, that only third party written documentation is can be accepted for this particular um, condition under Category 3. Next slide, please. The second condition under Category 3 is that the individual has not had a lease, ownership interest, or occupancy agreement in permanent housing during the preceding 60 days. Notice that on the list of um, documentation that's acceptable, intake staff observation is not included. And this is because it's not really appropriate, it's not very likely that the intake staff would, would know the housing history of the individual from the preceding 60 days, so they cannot confirm that via an intake observation. So intake staff would be seeking third-party documentation, either written or oral, what is available or appropriate will depend on the specific housing history of the individual. So if the individual at some point in the preceding 60 days was homeless or received outreach services, was unsheltered, there would be an HMIS um, service or, or stay record if they access emergency shelter or um, outreach services. Um, if they were with a housing provider, um, that housing provider might be able to provide a homeless certification or a written referral attesting to the, to the fact that they did not have a lease ownership interest or occupancy agreement during the preceding 60 days. Um, if they were doubled up, um, their, their friend or family, the tenant or homeowner of the unit might be able to provide either third-party written or third-party oral verification. In the event that third-party documentation cannot be, be obtained, then self-certification is allowed. Um, although no, it's not required, we always recommend due diligence and um, that, that due diligence be um, documented in the case file. Next slide, please. The third condition under Category 3 is that the individual demonstrate persistent instability. That's two or more moves within the preceding 60 days. Um, the record keeping requirement is for self-certification that is then verified by third party written or oral documentation. Now, again, intake staff observation is missing from this list because it's unlikely that intake staff will have will have a 60-day history on the individual that is presenting to them for um, services and assistance. So, um, and in terms of third-party 
documentation, if written or oral is not available, then intake staff must document their due diligence. It's a requirement for this particular condition of Category 3. Now, the actual housing history of the individual will, will dictate what is appropriate, and the documentation might include eviction notices, letters from family or friends, letters from other service providers who, who are directly familiar with the household's housing history. Note that there is an exception for moves that were prompted by flight from BV. So per the regulations, when a move was due to the individual or family fleeing domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, or stalking, then the intake worker may obtain a written certification from the individual or head of household seeking assistance, that's a false certification, that they were fleeing the situation and that they resided at the address where they were residing prior to the flight. Next slide, please. This last condition under Category 3 is that the household be expected to retain their status as homeless for an extended period due to special needs or two or more employment barriers. The regulation is very specific about what constitutes documentation of special needs. It must be third-party written, diagnosis from professional, licensed in the state to diagnose and treat the condition, or might be an intake observation, but it must be confirmed by written diagnosis from a, a professional licensed by the state, again, to diagnose and treat that condition. The intake observation must be confirmed within 45 days. So here we see that self-certification is not an option, and intake observation has limited use. It must be confirmed by a written diagnosis. Next slide, please. The regs are also very specific about what constitutes documentation of two or, or more employment barriers. These have to be third-party documentation, preferably written. They may be oral if written cannot be obtained in a timely manner. These include employment records, Department of Correction records, literacy or English proficiency tests, or other reasonable documentation depending on the employment history of the individual. Notice that intake observation and self-certification cannot be used. Next slide, please. This is a poll question, so I'll turn it over to Anne. Great. Thank you so much, Teresa. So this next poll question is, I think, probably a little bit harder than some of the, old, the other poll questions we've had. And the question is, what type of documentation is used to confirm that an unaccompanied youth is homeless under another applicable federal statute? So it's not the, entire, the entirety of Category 3, but whether they are um, homeless, considered homeless, under another federal statute. Is it third-party written, third-party oral, intake observation, self-certification, or all of the above? I'll wait for you all to hit your buttons. Great. So as you can see up on your screen, uh, it was pretty well split between A and E, and the correct answer is actually A. So congratulations to those of you who, who got it right. And the reason that it's A, third-party written verification must be provided by the agency that administers that other federal program. And that is the only form of documentation that can be used to confirm homeless status under another federal statute. And just to go a little bit further, um, it, let's say you were going to use the Department of Education definition, you would want the school to provide you a written verification because our providers under the McKinney Act programs funded by HUD are not experts in other types of um, homeless definitions used by other agencies. So you would want to get third-party written documentation from the school in that case that that person, uh, that that unaccompanied youth meets that definition. Okay, so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Tom to talk about Category 4.
Great. Thanks, Dan. Uh, the last category, Category 4, is for persons who are fleeing or attempting to flee uh, domestic violence or other violent situations, as, as uh, indicated in the regulation. Um, there are three conditions that uh, are pertinent to this category, not just uh, uh, that a person is fleeing or attempting to flee uh, domestic violence, but also that a person has no subsequent residence and that a person lacks resources uh, and support networks to obtain other housing, uh, very similar to the Category 2 criteria in that respect. Um, in uh, for Category 4, uh, self-certification is uh, used to document all three conditions. Uh, however, the self-certification requirements vary by the type of provider determining the homeless status, and we're going to talk about this uh, next. There is an overarching principle here that I want to stress that uh, Anne uh, touched on at the very beginning and, and Teresa as well, which is that in no case uh, is it expected or would it be appropriate and certainly uh, not professional to put anyone's safety at risk in order to document uh, their uh, uh, the fact that they're uh, fleeing domestic violence or attempting to flee this domestic violence. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, the uh, self-certification requirements vary uh, somewhat depending on the type of provider who is certifying uh, the homeless status. If uh, the provider is a victim service provider, uh, then uh, self-certification of all three conditions is uh, acceptable. And you can, uh, uh, dependent on the, the circumstances, um, the requirement uh, uh, can be applied in one of two ways. It can be a signed and dated certification by the individual or head of household presenting for assistance, uh, or it can be an oral statement that is uh, recorded by the intake staff and signed by the intake uh, staff um, as being true and complete, again, certified uh, by uh, the intake staff. Uh, ultimately, the recorded statement uh, should be an accurate reflection and, and not omit any relevant details um, provided by the household. Next slide, please. Of course, the other type of provider would be a non-victim service provider. So non-victim service providers uh, may also use self-certification. Uh, however, there are some caveats here, some important caveats that we want to briefly discuss. One is that if there is no threat to safety, uh, if in the professional judgment and the assessment that's conducted that there would be no threat to safety, and self-certification must also be supported by third-party uh, written uh, verification uh, from an entity, whether it be law enforcement or a service provider um, uh, or other source of uh, pastoral care, other uh, source of assistance um, that uh, provided uh, assistance uh, related to the domestic violence, the dating violence, sexual assault, or stalking, or other violent situations. That third party from whom that person sought assistance uh, must provide a sort of written verification um, of uh, the situation. However, I want to stress again, only in uh, instances where that would not in any way uh, jeopardize uh, the safety of the household. If it would threaten the safety of the household, then intake worker observation, their own assessment uh, as the intake worker talking with uh, the uh, household presenting uh, is sufficient. And that intake worker observation, again, as noted uh, uh, previously, uh, should be uh, documented uh, in the, uh, the case file as well. If, uh, in, if in any case um, uh, that uh, if the intake uh, worker observation uh, is used, um, only the minimum amount of information is necessary uh, for the record. Um, uh, there is no need for a full-scale uh, assessment or uh, inordinate amount of uh, information. Um, what constitutes third-party verification of a flight to a, uh, or attempt to flee uh, domestic violence? Basically, a written referral can be provided by any organization from whom the individual or head of household has sought assistance for uh, domestic violence or other violence, uh, as I indicated. Um, next slide, please. The other thing uh, to note is that 
for the other two conditions, if, uh, if the entity is a non-victim service provider who's, um, who the um, uh, person has presented to, then you still must um, verify uh, the other two conditions, no other housing options, no subsequent uh, or no uh, resources or support networks. Uh, that may be provided uh, by uh, self-certification. Um, by the um, applicant, self-certification must be signed and dated uh, by uh, the uh, person uh, presenting, again, clearly indicating that they have no subsequent residence resources uh, or support networks and indicating that the information is true and complete. Similar to um, certifications of homeless status and other standardized forms, uh, information uh, uh, certifying a person is fleeing or attempting to flee domestic violence and that they meet the other conditions, no subsequent residence resources and support networks, can be gathered by virtue of a standardized fill-in-the-blank type of form for ease of completion and to assure uh, complete and um, accurate information that's signed and dated. At this point, I'm going to pass it back to Anne for a final poll. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so the next poll question is about category four, and it's a true or false. True or false, only victim service providers can issue written certification of flight from or attempting to flee domestic violence. I'll give everybody a moment. Great. So the vast majority of you all got this question right. The answer is false. While DV certification can be issued um, by a domestic violence service provider, um, it can also be issued by any type of organization from whom the individual or head of household has sought assistance related to domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, or stalking. So that could include housing service providers, social workers, law enforcement officials, um, health care providers, pastoral counselors, um, but it's not limited to that particular set that I just read off. Um, before I turn it back over to Tony to wrap us up, I first wanted to note that there's a lot of questions coming into the help desk uh, that are really asking about specific types of eviction notices, and I would encourage you to please submit those to the help desk. Uh, eviction is different in every state. So we would actually have to take a look at the specific type of notice that you're asking us about um, uh, you know, in terms of whether that meets the requirement or not. So please submit those to the help desk. And I want to thank everybody for uh, hanging in with us today. I know we went a little bit uh, over our time, um, but I thank you for participating. And uh, for those of you whose questions weren't answered while we were online on the help desk, uh, please submit them to the help desk. And Tony, so I think I will turn it back over to you to close us out. Thank you, Anne. Okay, folks, we've come to the end of our webinar. And hopefully, as a result, you should now be able to understand the requirements necessary to develop local policies and procedures for record keeping, to incorporate and use HUD's hierarchy for documentation in these local policies and procedures, adopt and use documentation standards to ensure compliant records, and identify acceptable documentation for each homeless definition category. So I echo Anne by thanking you for taking the time to attend. If you submitted a question that we did not answer, again, be sure to submit it through the virtual help desk through the HRE. And we also ask that you complete the online survey survey that you will be receiving a link to to tell us how well this webinar met its objectives. This helps us to inform future webinars. So please join us on May 15th for the second part of this documentation series on at-risk status and income record keeping requirements. And with that, thank you very much and have a good rest of your day. <laughs>